So every time I get in front of groups like these, I remember a public speaking class I had about 10 years ago, and they actually videotaped the class, so you actually see yourself, and it was just you on there. And uh, I got the nickname Big Hands Tomko. I have pretty big hands, and I was wearing a black suit, and all you could see is these hands just sort of flying around the screen. So um, I'll, I've, I've tried to learn and practice and do better at that, but that's my, my first thought whenever I get up here. Um, Thank you to Utah Valley University. I've uh, really enjoyed working with the school and having opportunities like this. And like Joel said, I've probably hired a dozen UVU students uh, over the last few years and had a great experience. Um, my vice president of sales, who will be here, um, was a graduate from UVU two years ago. Like Joel said, started as an account manager and he was ready to work. He was awesome the point I'm hiring another UVU, he's a current student, he'll be graduating in, in April uh, on Monday to start on our sales team as well. And we'll probably hire two more in the spring, so um, if you're interested after you hear what I say, you know, we'd love to talk to you, it's probably a few months out, but um, we always love to, to work with uh, great students. Um, I want to start out today and kind of tell you the why behind what I do. Um, you know, my family is most, most important to me, and I do have five great kids and a great wife, and uh, you know, really trying to balance what I do work-wise and with my family has been an important thing for me. All my kids are 10 and under, so it's chaos at our house, but you, know, you figure out how to do your home life and your, your professional life all at once, and uh, that's what drives me to, to work harder. Um, I wanted to kind of give you an idea of what's important to me first. Um, and, and you'll see as I talk that I didn't put off other things that are important to me to focus on my career now. I think you need to look at those things that are most important to you and find opportunities to do those even while you're young in your career. So my, my family, my religion, and then uh, promoting education, mentorship, and economic development are all things that are very important to me. And I've been able to do all those things through my business and through my home life and those things, and you don't have to put those off. You can find opportunities to do, do all those things at once. I, I watched a few of the, the uh, past executive lectures, and I love them. I love listening to stories of, of these great entrepreneurs and business leaders as they um, have built these great companies. And I remember sitting, you know, I did four years at BYU and then four years of grad school, I sat in a lot of these lecture series and I would always say, wow, that's awesome. That guy made a billion dollars. How do I go from here to there? Uh, my, my goal today isn't to give you a, a pathway from here to a billion dollars, but it's, it's to give you a pathway of things that you can be working on now that will put you in the crossroads for opportunities as they're gonna come throughout your career, whether it's right when you graduate or 10 years down the road. Um, and, and I, wanted, I want to sort of paint that story by telling you a little bit of my personal story first, and then I'll actually go into a few more details on, on how you can leverage your education network and mentorship to, to prepare yourself for those opportunities that will come down the road. So I want to kind of start way back, and this may be earlier than I would normally go, but um, I grew up in a, a large family, nine kids, grew up outside of Seattle. Um, my dad worked in construction. Although he was a college graduate, he had decided to go in that field, and we didn't have a lot of money growing up, particularly uh, being in Seattle with that many kids. Um, so I had, to, I had to learn a lot of um, financial lessons and entrepreneurship lessons out of necessity. If I wanted something, I had to figure out how to get it. Um, you know, what, my first kind of uh, inkling at entrepreneurship. So I, I played college football, and uh, when I was five, in fifth grade, I mean, I wanted to play football. We always got to play soccer growing up. Soccer costs 40 bucks a season. Football was like 250 bucks a season. And my mom did not want me to play football, but she didn't want to be the, the bad guy. So my mom came to me, to this 10-year-old boy, and says, well, if you can come up with 250 bucks between you know, now in April when signups are, you can play football. And she thought she had gotten away from being the bad guy, put it on money. Well, as a 10-year-old kid, I said, well, I want to play football. So I went and uh, went to all the neighbors, asked them, whenever you go on vacation, can I take care of your animals? Started babysitting. Sure enough, 
between January and April, I made 250 bucks as a 10-year-old boy and, and, uh, and played football. And it, it, it sort of set me on a path and a realization that if I work hard and I, and I think, I can get to those goals and achieve those things that, that I want to. And uh, it also was one of my lessons, top lessons learned that I'll hit at the end are that uh, I had a realization that I'm probably the only person that's willing to pay myself what I think I'm worth. And that's part of what's led me down the entrepreneurial path you know, from a young age is, you know, I think I'm worth $1,000 an hour. I might not be able to convince you that, but it, maybe I can go find a business that will pay me that much. Um, I got my first real job when I was 11. I walked dogs. And even then, my mind was always thinking, how can I do things better? How can I do things faster? And the requirement there was you had a certain track you know, through the woods. It was a path that you'd walk the dogs. They didn't care how fast you did it. So I realized if I ran the path, I could make about 20 bucks an hour as an 11-year-old running dogs around, around the path. All the other people took two or three hours to do the same thing. Just those little entrepreneurial mindsets, whatever your situation is, looking ways to improve upon it, uh, to do it better, do it faster, how am I gonna, gonna, gonna pay myself and sort of be my own boss, has been part of uh, what, I, what I've done. And uh, just a couple more foundational things. You know, hard work. You know, you look at opportunities that are gonna face you and you're, you're finishing college and doing different things. But the bottom line is, if you wanna get anywhere and do really well, you're gonna have to work hard. I, mean, I, I made cobblestone streets by hand when I was in high school. I thought they quit doing that 3,000 years ago in Egypt. I was out there laying stones, roads, you know, full, full on, working hard. Um, and I started a landscape company. I realized if I could get them to pay me 15 bucks an hour and pay my friends seven, you know, I could make my 15 plus the other eight, and I was making 23 bucks an hour, you know, in, in high school. But, but it was all hard work. And, and whether it's a desk job or a physical job, you know, getting from here to there is gonna be a lot of work. And I don't wanna paint a, a rosy picture other than that, um, that, you know, if you wanna achieve something great, you're gonna to have to work hard to get there. Um, you know, and finally, I had a, a young opportunity, sort of cemented some of these things together. I had an opportunity to be an LDS missionary in Thailand. It was a tough place to be, but it also, you know, I thought I was poor growing up. I saw a new level of, of poverty and poorness that gave me a gratitude for what I had, but I think it's what's driven me uh, to value education and mentorship and economic development so much, because I saw what I could do uh, within you know, my own life, but you know, how can I elevate others as well? So I'll give you a quick uh, business timeline. I'll throw in some tidbits of lessons I learned here, and then I'll, I'll really hit home some of those as we, we finished out uh, through here. But you'll probably see throughout my, my life and career that I've had a lot of decision points and crossroads where I could choose to go one way or the other. Something could be very discouraging, or it forced me to look for an opportunity uh, to do something more. Um, I was probably at your point in my undergrad when uh, the sort of first tech bubble market crash in the late 2000s, or early 2000s was, and I had a kind of a cool investment banking internship. About a month before I was supposed to start, the market totally crashed, and the company told all the partners that if they wanted interns, it was coming out of the partner's salary. Needless to say, all the partners chose not to have interns that year. So I was, you know, a month before summertime, uh, just got married, was transferring from Ricks College to, to BYU and without a job. You know, what's my opportunity? Well, I was like, I can go get a school job, make eight bucks an hour, or I've always been interested in real estate. Why don't I get my real estate license and see what I can do? So that, that potential bad situation turned into a good one. I got my real estate license and that's how I paid my way through undergrad and grad school and bought my first house and, and was able to do those things. But it was you know, one of those crossroad points. You can be discouraged or you can look for a new opportunity and, and make the best out of it. Um, there were sort of, throughout my life, there are things that sort of led me to be an entrepreneurial person. There was sort of this uh, sort of culminating experience or moment um, right at the end of my undergrad, it was in 03, I was selling real estate, I was going through the accounting program at BYU, one of the top programs in the country, 
And I was like, man, I really don't want to do accounting. And the month before the semester, sorry, accounting's good. I just didn't want to do accounting. <laughs> um, just before um, my final semester, um, I had like four deals come together all at once. And one of them was a big office building. And, uh, you know, I made 50000 in commission in one month. And I was like, holy cow, I am never getting a real job. And that's like set me on the path ever since then. I sort of knew and I was leaning that way, but you know, that, that was sort of the final experience. And I've never had a month like that um, in real estate since then. But yeah, I almost, I think I got blessed with that experience to make sure I was fully solid on the, the entrepreneurial path um, to get there. Um, how many of you are graduating this year? So two thirds or so. Um, how many of you have done, had a job while you're going to school? Or currently have one, so it looks like a good portion or most. How many have started a business or worked with a startup while they're in school? It's a small handful. So one of, one of the things I thought was super valuable during my education is what, what better testing grounds to try a startup or try a new business while you're in school. No one's expecting you to make money. If your business doesn't succeed, you go through the normal job recruiting process. And so the, all of the next experiences, um, most of the way down the page, were all while I was in graduate school. So I, I went to BYU and did my, my law degree and my MBA at the same time. And as I was going through, I quickly realized that I did not want to practice law in the same way that I realized I did not want to practice accounting. Neither of them are bad, they're great education, it just wasn't, wasn't for me. And so I did this first uh, startup, Hood FX. And uh, it's kind of a fun one, it was an MP3 player that plays music outside of your car. And uh, I had a partner who was an attorney that I was interning for, and we started the company, we raised $300,000, hired a team of engineers, they spent all of our money, we produced 1,000 units of product in China, and the business failed. Um, but I learned a lot of great lessons along the way in that failure, and I'm, I'm sort of grateful to have a failure like that fairly young and fairly early on because it, it taught me a lot of lessons um, as, I, as I went down the road and, and did it, uh, transactions that were much larger than that and uh, sort of protected me from losing money in those, uh, those kinds of scenarios. Um, I continued through my education and through my networking. That was one thing I'm really going to emphasize on. I grew up poor family. My dad was in construction. I had no connections at all, but I started networking really young. And through that first business, I was a semifinalist twice in the BYU business plan competition, which means I got judged by a bunch of entrepreneurs and venture capitalists who I made sure to make relationships with and all of whom I'm still friends with. And it gave me opportunities and connections into these these next deals and opportunities that I, that I worked in. Um, I had an opportunity to meet uh, a wealthy family from, from New York. They had close to a billion dollars. And uh, they wanted me to help them start a couple of businesses. Who was here a couple of weeks ago when Ray Kelly was speaking? I love Ray, he's awesome. I, I actually got, I wrote the original business plan for the American Academy, which is now Graduation Alliance, up there with that family from, from New York. So I was in school at the time, so I, could, I didn't want to quit and run the business at the time. And so we brought other managers in. We raised a few million dollars from vSpring and Peterson and a few of the other investment firms around here. And that one was able to grow. Um, but through that experience, this family in New York got to know me and uh, asked me to come and help them. They had just sold their company, and they said, hey, we have almost a billion dollars. We need somebody to help us invest it. Uh, we trust you. What do you think? So I had no intention of ever going into asset management, private equity, venture capital, any of those things. But the networks I'd built and the work experience I'd made you know, made me a prime candidate from those opportunities came that I was able to jump on those and, and uh, participate in that. Um, Ocean Road was an interesting firm. It was all the money was one family's money. So it's good and bad. It's good in that. It was easy to make decisions and get things done. It was bad because it was a family trying to make those, those decisions together. And they, 
Uh, they were great. They'd been very successful in real estate. Um, the dad had been the CEO of the fourth largest ad agency in the world for 50 years. Um, I was able to learn a lot from them. Um, and you know, you've probably heard of the proverbial golden handcuffs that come on. It's you know when your compensation and future compensation equity become at a point where you're almost stupid to walk away. And I'd sort of hit one of those situations here with this family. I had the job I dreamed of when I was 50, when I was in my late 20s. And we were renegotiating sort of the long-term deal for me to continue to work with that family. And I sort of had this internal dialogue in my head. It was, man, if I can get them to pay me X hundred thousand dollars a year plus X percent of, of the, the growth of the fund that we were managing, then I'll stay. If not, I'm gonna go do what I wanna do. So for two or three months, I kept throwing these numbers out in my head. If I can negotiate them to this number, then I'll stay. And we were consciously in negotiation this whole time trying to get the deal together. And I finally just realized, I better go do what I wanna do. I shouldn't be having a money discussion, you know, questioning what I really want to do for money you know, at that point in my life. And uh, I came to the conclusion, leave my job, leave New York. So I had to go to this family who had given me all of these opportunities up here um, it paid me a lot of money and were, were willing to continue to do that down the road. Um, I walked away from the golden handcuffs and I know on a few deals how much I would have made and it's painful sometimes still to think about it, but it was, it was the right choice to make. But I think you'll find um, that it's the tough decisions and those pivot points in your career and decisions that will define who you are as a person. And um, I think one of the most important things I learned from that situation one, I knew I was an entrepreneur, but even more important is I knew that I had other values and other things in my life that were worth more to me than money, and I was willing to walk away when the money was right there. You can theoretically have that discussion in your mind, but when it's right there, are you really gonna make the, the tough decisions? And, and being able to prove that to myself, um, I think was as valuable as any of the other lessons that I had learned from that opportunity or the money that I had made, is that am I willing to be you know, a principles-based person? Am I willing to be someone who, um, you know, creates a path that is the path that I feel is best for me regardless of where the, the financial returns uh, come out? And, you know, I would probably have more cash in the bank if I had stayed there, even right now, years later. I probably have a higher net worth on paper from some of the businesses I own, but it took a long time for that line to cross and sort of a lot of faith to take that leap. But those tough decisions are those career and life-defining decisions that um, I think are most important. So as you face those, take those seriously. And unfortunately, often the hardest road is the right road to, to take in those decisions. So when I left uh, New York, part of the reason I left is I had started my career as an entrepreneur and I would always wanted to be an entrepreneur. And so as I uh, left, I had kind of two options. I could go start a business or I could go buy a business. And fortunately, I knew a lot of private equity investors and uh, was able to uh, convince a few of them to back me. And they basically said, if you go buy a business, we'll put the money in and you can own a chunk of the business and, and we'll go from there. So I left, looked at buying a business for six months or eight months and ultimately came to the conclusion that uh, I had enough time, money, and spousal support to do a startup again. And uh, the spousal support was a, a key element there because she had to walk away from the golden handcuffs as much as I did and then see that I'm going to go do a startup and might not take a salary for a year, which I did. Um, you know, it was a, a tough decision. But, but at that point, um, I decided, okay, entrepreneurial mode. What do I love to do? I wasn't super passionate about any, any industry. And I think going back to some of the things you learned from Ray a couple weeks ago, of you know, what type of CEO are you, um, you also need to come to an understanding of sort of what type of entrepreneur and business you know, person. There's some people that get into things because they're super passionate about an industry. Some get into something because they're really good at you know, a certain area. Others think there's a great market for something. And, and for me, my passion in entrepreneurship was how can I find a business problem out there and create a business model that's a real solution to a real problem that people have. And the reason for me that that was so important is, 
you know, we're out selling and sort of evangelizing our product, if you really don't believe that it has value, it's, it's hard to go without a paycheck. It's hard to work hard. It's hard to really push hard to sell something. And that's what was important to me. And uh, one of my friends had a, an offshore, had an internet marketing and web design business, and he had offshore employees, and those employees um, had, had different issues. The power would go out for a week in one of their small towns, or they'd go AWOL, or he found one great programmer, but how could I find another one? And as he looked to go and institutionalize his offshore uh, team, he realized how much it costs to do business offshore. Labor's cheap, everything else is really expensive. So the idea for Xylan uh, came at that point. Um, give you a little background. I think I missed. Oh. I'll skip to this. We can go back there. Give you a little background on Xylan. Um, here's kind of, we call it our case open, you call it elevator pitch, but kind of the, the basic uh, idea of what we do. Essentially, we, we set up remote teams for our clients in the Philippines. Uh, we provide the recruiting, employment, and infrastructure for those teams, and then our clients manage their own teams directly. So essentially, we're setting up their own offshore office for a company, but we provide the economies of scale on those expensive uh, other costs around labor. Um, uh, I think I see some of my guys here. Tony, my CEO, and Kyle, my VP of sales. Kyle's the famous UVU guy I've been talking about uh, up here. And uh, so we, we've been able to uh, build the company and build our teams and uh, uh, build a fun business as well as uh, create economic development opportunities throughout the world. So the picture here on your left is our actual office building uh, in the Philippines. I know many of you are hoping to see some hut, third world country, dirt floor outsourcing, but our, our plan was enterprise level. Uh, here's the area we're in, in the, the Visayas region of uh, the Philippines. Um, I was uh, just talking before the meeting. We had an earthquake, 7.2 earthquake uh, a month ago. They had a tornado about a week ago, which they never have tornadoes in the Philippines. And is it a class three hurricane? Something like that. Class five, sorry, even better. Class five hurricane is scheduled to hit our island here in, uh, in uh, the next eight hours or so. So we've had some tense times and the, the people over there have. So there's, there's pluses and minuses. As well as we can run our business over there, there's the you know, acts of God provisions you put into contracts. Those actually come into play in our business when uh, you have to, re you know, try to provide a certain level of service when you, know, you can't decide if an earthquake comes or not and you can prepare all you want. Um, we uh, skip over some of these because I need to, to cruise a little bit. We provide a wide variety of custom positions to our, to our clients. So we're a custom recruiting team. So almost any company would come to us and say, I need a programmer that knows PHP, MySQL, JavaScript, HTML. Um, What's that going to cost? We'll quote them a price. We'll go recruit the team. But we have teams of CPAs, CAD designers, structural engineers, call reps, virtual assistants, uh, content writers. Uh, we custom recruit um, almost anything to our clients' needs because our goal and our core competency was we're going to be great recruiters and great infrastructure. And our clients are going to be the experts on the actual subject matter of their business. And that's what's allowed us to scale, is keeping a focus on that competency and uh, try to continually educate our clients that they're in charge of uh, managing their employees and managing their teams. Uh, we've had some, some fun, fun milestones. I'll hit a little bit more on, on uh, some partners investor stuff later, later but uh, we have a couple of investors from Boston. They've been uh, good for us as we, we started out the company. Um, I'm a huge proponent of bootstrapping. Uh, we actually only raised the small chunk of money just so when we started the business, we could go out to other companies and say, we're backed by some Boston-based private equity firms. Sounded a lot better when we had zero employees in the Philippines to, to have something that uh, they could rely on and trust. Um, we've had some crazy growth. We went from zero to 500 employees in 10 months. I don't know if you guys have worked at companies that have grown, but if you just think of the, the, the sheer number of people, at that time we had three or four employees in the US, and we probably only had six or eight people on our Philippine management team. 
We had a month, seven months into the business where we hired 200 people in one month. So you have to screen, hire, buy equipment, office space. Um, I think we went through five offices in like four months because we just had no idea. You go and buy a 50 seat office and all of a sudden you get a huge client. So we went and got 200 and then they're like, well, we really need 400. So we go get another office and we're renegotiating leases and trying to break other ones. And it was, it was pretty exciting. And uh, one of the best lessons I learned through that process and really uh, Tony, my, my COO is the one that taught it to me the most is we can get lucky a few times and we did. There was probably 20 times our business should have failed when you're growing that fast and running a remote business. And we were grateful for the success that we had. But what we realized, though, is there becomes a point where you, don't, you can't just rely on luck anymore. And that's where systems and processes come into play. And uh, being able to come in and say, OK, we got lucky the first time, but how do we build a company that, so we can do this again so it's because we're prepared and we have skill? What did we learn? And that's sort of the constant process that we're going through is, is how to improve so that risk reduces every time. You know? So now there's not 20 chances we can fail a year. There's probably still five. You know, if this hurricane uh, wipes things out for a couple of weeks, uh, <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see how uh, forgiving some of our clients are. But we were able to uh, uh, build the company fast. And then it sort of grew into two different parts. And this was another one of those you know, scenarios where I pound in. Those tough decisions are what define you as a person and define you as a company. We had never intended to be heavy in the call center space. Uh, but as we grew, the couple of the larger clients we had were call center clients. So we ended up having a huge call center team. And, and I, I don't know how well this is planned or we just sort of ended up lucky, but we ended up with one facility that had most of our technical employees and other uh, back-end support type employees, and we had a separate facility that was our call center uh, type employees. So we were able, about a year and a half into the business, to sell 90 or 95% of the assets of the business and sold off that call center stuff. And the, the reason the decision was to so tough is we were making great money from that call center stuff, but it wasn't the business we had intended to be in. And we chose to take a price that's probably lower for that part of our business than we could have gotten for it if we held on to it for years um, in order to build the kind of business that we really wanted to build and to deal with the types of companies and people and clients that we really wanted to, to deal with. And it wasn't just sort of tough decision and faith on my part. The rest of our team had to go through that pivot. And you know, guys like Tony from my team were over in the Philippines dealing with that transition real time you know, as we were going through it. But it, it uh, gave us a restart uh, position, and like I was saying, how do we build a foundation so that when we build this up again, it's more out of skill than luck? I'll never say that there's not luck involved in situations, but you sort of mitigate your risk as you, as you redo those things. And my, my current sort of process in, in learning um, on the business has been building the right team. And uh, I had this moment about 15 minutes of like, I'm awesome about two years ago. I was like, I'm so important to sales. I'm so important to operations. This is great. And then about 15 minutes later, I had this horrible sinking feeling that I'm so vital to operations and I'm so vital to sales. I haven't built up an organization in, around me. And I was, I was lucky to find Tony about that time. Um, and he came on, and, and he's way better than me in operations and systems and process and all of those things. And as your company grows up, you have to realize that people are going to be better than you in certain areas. And, and then, so I was still heavily involved in sales and business development. I still am. Um, but recently, I've started to do that same thing with Kyle. Kyle has become better than me at the closing process and getting the deals done and managing our team and growing the team. And so I've started to push that off onto him. So I'd say that's an in-process one. I think I've learned the principle. Um, but as we build out the team, um, you know, that's when you know you've built a, a good business as an entrepreneur, when you can look around and say, hey, there's guys that are better than me in this business at these certain areas, and people that are going to allow us to, to scale to four, five, six, seven, ten times uh, as large as we are now. Um, I'm going to 
go back. This isn't a, a kind of toot my own horn thing, but our business has been able to grow fast and earn a lot of rewards and, and recognition, and it's it's uh, been beneficial for us, and I think almost as valuable, you know, for us here, for our employees offshore who don't get to really see what's happening with the company over here so much. A lot of these uh, recognitions have been uh, sort of key, sort of PR and morale boosting things for them to see that they're part of a, a great organization. And my favorite part of them is this is like the best free PR you can get because it usually comes from magazines and then it ranks really high in the, the search engine stuff. So that's, uh, that's been a fun opportunity to be a part of something that's done well and, and gotten that recognition. Um, I think uh, Joel, when he introduced me, told some of the other things I'm involved in. I'm not going to go through each of them, but I just wanted to, back on one of my first slides, I showed you some of those things that I'm passionate about. And although I can't be in business and be currently uh, involved in a business full time that, that uh, ties to my passions, uh, one way for me that I've found to be able to keep tied into those is through different boards I'm on. And so, um, the board here, you know, I love helping UVU with its growth and also it keeps a foot in the investment world where I came from. So I've really enjoyed that. Uh, education is one of the most important things to me. BYU, Idaho, kind of same way. Um, and through some of these other companies we've had, we've been able to hire and teach and mentor uh, through teaching at BYU and other places. But there's ways, I'm a, you know, a lot of people come and say, should I do this right now? Should I start a business or should I finish college? I was like, come back to me with a plan that says, I'm going to finish college and start a business. And uh, I like to think about life <coughs> in terms of and instead of or. And if you have passions, figure out a way to do and. Uh, but you do have to figure out how to balance uh, between, you know, family life. I don't know how many of you are married or have kids, but those are major considerations for me now. So I have to balance my professional stuff with those, um, those changes as well. So it took longer than I was hoping, so I'm going to have to go fast through this part. Um, I always, my favorite part of when the guest speaker came was them telling their story. Um, but like I told you at the beginning, I always felt like there was this chasm of, well, what can I do now to at least start heading on a path in that direction? And I want to hit a few areas that I'm passionate about. Um, because they, they allowed me to go from where I was, uh, you know, growing up in my, the financial situation to be able to, to learn and to be able to be an entrepreneur. So I want to talk a little about uh, mentorship, oh, sorry, education, networking, and then mentorship. Um, education can come in a few different ways, and sometimes, and it's dangerous to say this here, sometimes your formal education isn't the most valuable, and probably usually isn't the most valuable. It's a good foundation. But the, the technical or on-the-job or experiential uh, education that you can get is, is even more important. So as you're in school and look for opportunities and there's a, you know, an opportunity to do a, a, you know, a marketing case study for a real-life company you know, and you're not getting paid for it, jump on and do it. Get that experience. Add another you know, bow in your, or another arrow in your quiver. Look for those opportunities to join a club and meet new people and meet new peers. Um, you know, get online, download a, a, a program, and learn how to code a basic website. You know, just do some of these things that add to your educational value, because um, as I look at, talk about networking, mentorship, one of the things you can add early in your career and coming out of school are some of the, the things that you've learned through your, your experiences in education. And the reality is, most, most companies will get started from people who went and got a career or a regular job, and they're there at the career, and they see, hey, there's a better way to do what this company is doing. I'm going to start my business and do that. Or they're going through their education, and they learn something there, and it triggers an, an idea for a business or things that you do there. So continually educate yourself, but make sure you educate yourself on the broader scale of experience and technical as well as the, the formal education. Um, I don't have time to do this whole thing, so I'm going to go pretty fast through networking. Um, but this is probably one of the most valuable things in my career, and one of the things that we really uh, push with our sales team at Xilin is, is getting networked uh, as fast as you can and get tied in with all of the networks that, uh, that you're a part of. 
But the, when I think of networking, there's a few, a few words, and we'll hit these over a couple more times, but think of giving instead of receiving. So give first, uh, give more, be respectful, and be bold. Um, I have to go pretty fast. So a network is uh, interconnected parts that make the system succeed. And you want to be part of that network. You're not a leech. You're not something that just pulls out. You're part of a system, and you're helping the whole network succeed. Um, yeah, social networking, why do we do it? Business networking, why do we do it? They're both all about people. People know that social networking is about people and relationships. They often forget that business networking also has to be about people and relationships as well. It's not about sales, it's not about money. Those things will come, but if you go in with that focus, people will smell that quickly and you're, you're out of the network at that point. And so, uh, think of the people. Um, if I can share these slides, I will, because I'm going to go fast through here, but you may think, well, what networks do I have? What value do I have? I graduated from high school four years ago, and then I've been in, been in school since, or whatever the path has been, but here's just a few ideas. You know, businesses you've worked in, current classmates. I've done deals with probably half a dozen classmates that I've gone to school with, and I'm still doing deals with them. Uh, alumni of the university, community, family, church, government, teams, clubs. If you go through each of those lists and list you know, five or 10 people you've met in each of those categories, you realize that your network is pretty large. But then think about the second degree network from them. So if each of them has 50 valuable people in your network and you're able to come up with 100, all of a sudden you have 5,000 people that you have access to uh, to help learn and mentor and, and uh, further your career. Um, I'm going to mostly skip over this one. These are just a lot of uh, things that, that we use, personal network, social networks like LinkedIn, different groups. Locally, there's a lot of very active networking groups, and Joel and I actually interacted a lot of these together. Joel, what do you think we see each other three times a month at <laughs> other random stuff? So, Yeah, definitely. And, and that's where we built a lot of our, our great friendships and things with uh, friends and others. There's industry groups, events, trade shows, at school there's clubs, uh, your major. Um, again, as you build that network, it's only vi viable and valuable if you keep track of it. And there's some easy things, like if you do your networking, connect everyone through Facebook, that's fine. I like to have sort of my personal networking through Facebook and my business stuff through LinkedIn, because my personal contacts don't really want to hear about my business and my business contacts don't really want to hear about, you know, my kid ran a mile race the other day. So you can choose what to do. I've kind of separated the two of them. Uh, people you meet at events, uh, find companies you're interested, join groups, talk to the alumni. But going back to the beginning point, once you're in a network or to get in a network, you want to be a valuable part of it and not get kicked out of that network. And, you know, the point I hope to sort of uh, pound home here with, uh, with this is think about the network as you giving. The receiving part will come back as you, as you give to that network. Um, and uh, respect their time and privacy. Say you are, uh, somehow got networked into Bill Gates or Warren Buffett. Would you just go intro them into other people you know? I don't think so. You're going to be very uh, protective of certain parts of your network and share them with only people who are going to respect their time and privacy as well. Um, and then regular, valuable, relevant contacts. So, you know, don't keep reaching out and say, hey, are there any jobs at your company yet? You know, do you have, you know, will you invest in my company now? You know, if they're in uh, the software industry and you've read a cool article on how, you know, software development is booming in Russia or something, you know, hey, I was thinking of you, thought you would enjoy this, this uh, article. Send them things that are relevant to them and helpful. Or if you see them post on LinkedIn, hey, we're hiring a senior VP of sales. You say, hey, I know this guy and this guy who are, um, that might be a, a good fit. So try to add value into the network and then you'll see the benefits come back out. And uh, finally, be bold. I think you'll go to events and do different things and sit around the corner and be like, I don't know if that lady or that guy is gonna wanna talk to me. You know, just go step forward, have a, have a conversation. Be the one that steps out there because the problem is the wealthy, successful people they often don't need to add more contacts, and they may not be the one to go find you in the corner and say hi. Um, 
you know, take a step forward and go approach them in, in the different opportunities. Um, so, you know, where are we at and where, how can we give? You know, and what value? You know, time, money, knowledge, empathy, hard work, and contacts. Um, I'm going to have to go really fast because I have five minutes left here. But, um, you know, you can add value to your network or be a valuable piece through the character that you build, through your technical competency, work experience, the network you share, the information you share with people. So even though you may not think, well, I don't have 10 years in an in industry and I don't have all this money, there's all these other things that are as valuable as money that can be given back into that network. And you know, maybe in 10 years, you'll be the one giving the mentorship and deals and money back to the rest of the network. But for now, this is a very viable and valuable piece um, to the system. Um, uh, finally, mentors before my, my last slide of kind of things that I've learned. Um, I, I can't uh, understate the value of, of mentors in my career. Um, my parents were great mentors to me in terms of the, the character things that I've talked about in building my network and the getting education pieces, but there really was no connection to, to business and discussion of business and opportunities around you know, talking about careers and all of those other things. And so I've had to find mentors outside of my family or that close-knit network to, to help me. Um, but mentors, uh, you know, can help you in a lot, of, a lot of different ways, you know, things that I've, you know, put on here, the advice that they can give you in your career, education, business ideas, you know, financing, partners, hiring, sales, management, all of these things that could be mistakes that could cost you years of time, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in money, and a lot of pain, people who have been through that process can guide and help you. And, and you know, if you have a career path you're looking at, find a mentor that's 10 years down the road and another mentor that's 20 years down the road, and they'll be able to give you different insights and different help and set you down a path of, what can I be doing today to get to that point? And you know, when you get to that next point, you have the guy that's or, uh, 20 years out there, that, you know, how do I get from this point to that next point? And uh, because there's really no roadmap, you know, you're at the point in life where, okay, I came back, got my degree, now what? It's sort of that open 30 years of I have to navigate my own path and, and mentors can really help you um, do that. Um, my, every job, I haven't used a resume, I don't think I ever have actually, um, to actually get my job. I've had to made, make them for school, but I never had to use a resume because I had mentors and other contacts within my network that recommended me in um, uh, through that way. And I've had mentors, you know, when I've needed to raise capital for business, I've had mentors who, you know, guided me in finding that and doing that. Um, I'm going to go fast through here, and I apologize. My wife warned me that I had like three hours of content uh, in my 50 minutes of slides, and she's always right. Um, I was worried I wouldn't have 50 minutes worth of content, so. Here we are with three minutes left. But uh, if you're starting a business or you're going to be running a business, cash is king. It doesn't matter if your profit and loss statements or net income or balance sheet, if all those look cool. What matters is do you have cash to pay your bills when the bills are due? You, know, you may get 100000 of sales and collect on the 30th, but all of your costs are due on the 2nd. On paper, your net income looks like you made a bunch of money, but you went bankrupt between the 2nd and the 30th. So, Focus on cash until you get to, well, always focus on cash. Some of those other statements are relevant when you're selling your business later. Um, bootstrap. Try to do as much as you can without raising outside capital. Um, I probably did 30 or 40 deals with um, entrepreneurs when I was in New York. I probably would not have accepted any of those deals being on the entrepreneurial side. They're great terms for us as investors. I just wouldn't want to operate in there. So work hard, sweat equity, uh, get people to work with you in there. Um, I hit that point of I'm the only person that pays me what I'm worth. We've already talked about the tough decisions will define you um, and be willing to take the hard road. Um, lead by example, choose your partners wisely. Um, I won't go into too much detail in there, but um, you know, a partnership is, is in a lot of ways like you're becoming married to that person. You're gonna spend more time uh, with them than you'd think and take those partnership decisions very seriously, whether to have one or not and who it's going to be. 
um, on the networking. Your network is your most valuable asset. Most of the deals and, and opportunities that I've had through my career have come through that network. And uh, building that now is going to pay dividends throughout your career. Um, talked about the mentor saving you years of time, millions of dollars, and a lot of pain. And uh, I know that to be true, all of those, because I've experienced some of the pain of trying things without a mentor. Um, when you hire, recruit on character, not just experience. I want people that are going to perform because it's intrinsic to them that they're going to work hard or they feel bad, not just they want to get rich, but they're going to be a great performer because of uh, the discipline and desire that they have. Um, you know, this empower employees and help them reach their potential is sort of a new lesson I've been, been learning just in the last uh, few weeks and months over my career. But um, people become great when you uh, allow them those opportunities. And finally, back to what I was talking about processes, uh, A-level processes are as important as A-level people. So build a structure and foundation about what you're doing in business and you'll succeed. Thanks for your time. Thank you for coming to speak with us today, and as a token of our appreciation, we've got a little present for you from UBU. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you.